Good evening. Welcome to our last live session of the Form and Function from Afar conference. We really appreciate you being here for this conference. I'm Andrew Hewitt, one of the instructors at Book Paper Thread, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's session, which is Todd Pattison presenting That's Probably Good Enough, 19th Century Bookbinding Mistakes. We're glad to have you uh, be here as part of three days of presentations and demonstrations by some of the most interesting and inspiring artists and craftspeople of our community. Form and Function from Afar was conceived late last year when the conferences and events that normally take place were canceled due to the pandemic. We were missing interacting with our community and thought that maybe 50 or 100 people might join us for an online get together and sharing of techniques, resources, and ideas. We've been excited to see how many of you, now over 2,000 people, have registered for the conference and how many have been making introductions of themselves and showing their work in the portal, connecting with friends and colleagues, and making new connections. We hope you'll continue that through the next few days and actually through the next month as we keep that portal open for you to continue the conversation and, uh, and find out what we've been doing. I wanna cover a few things about how this Zoom webinar will be run. This is slightly different than a Zoom meeting, which may be more familiar to you. Since we have large audience, attendees will not be able to connect by video, but you can certainly ask questions and make comments. There are two avenues for that, the chat and the Q&A sections which you'll see along the bottom of your screen. And we have assistance monitoring both. We will use the chat for sharing links to things that the presenter mentions during their talk. And the Q&A is where you can type in a question for the presenter. We will either type a response or the presenter may answer it at the end of the session. So only questions in the Q&A and comments or other types of sharing in the chat. If you think of a question after the fact, there's still space and time to post follow-up questions and continue on our continuing conversations area of the website. Lastly, if you experience issues continuing or other technical trouble, don't despair. This session is being recorded and will be available for view first on our conference website and later it'll up be uploaded to Book Paper Threads YouTube channel. So if you miss anything, you can circle back and rewatch any of these webinars. If you do post in the chat area, make sure that you change that little blue button, that pull down menu to panelists and attendees to make sure that everyone who's watching can see your comments. I'll introduce Todd in just a minute and hand it over to him. But first I wanna acknowledge our sponsors who made it possible for us to offer this virtual conference for all of you for free. We have 10 fabulous sponsors listed on the conference website. Please check them out and check out the virtual vendor fair where you can find out about them, follow links to their websites. And don't forget that many of the sponsors are offering discounts during the conference for the attendees and for a few days afterwards. So be sure to check out their listings in the vendor fair. I'd like to tell you a bit about Book Paper Thread. We are a collaboration of myself, Andrew Hewitt, Karen Hardy, and Linda Marshall. When all of our in-person gigs were canceled or postponed last year, we realized we'd have to make some changes to the way we taught. We met regularly to share our ideas and resources on how to do it remotely. We launched our first online workshops late August and have been growing our catalog of courses learning how to do it better each time we teach. We cover a variety of topics in the book and paper arts and offer different styles of workshops from pre-recorded uh, sessions over six weeks to live weekend workshops. We hope you'll be interested in exploring a workshop with us. Now I'd like to introduce Todd. Todd Pattison is the conservator at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. He's an active member of the New England chapter of the Guild of Book Workers, a fellow in the American Institute for Conservation of Historic 
and artistic works. And beginning in 2014 has taught the course American Publisher Bindings 1800 to 1900 for Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. And now I would like to pass it over to Todd. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I wanna thank you and Karen and Linda for um, putting this amazing conference together. And I'm, I'm incredibly honored that you asked me to present at it. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'll, I'll stop my video and share my screen. And I have a PowerPoint. Um, I'm, I'm a little too excited about this presentation. So I've been a little over ambitious. Um, and we have about 136 uh, slides to try to get through. Uh, and I'm hoping to get through those and still leave some time for questions at the end. So I'm not gonna take too much time here, but I just wanted to give a little bit of introduction. Really, thank you um, all so much for coming to the presentation tonight. I, I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna stop my video and share my screen and we'll get started. So I called this, that's probably good enough, 19th century bookbinding mistakes, because they thought that almost everything that you saw tonight was good enough, uh, at least good enough to sell, good enough to give to uh, a patron who asked them to do something, good enough to give to a publisher or a bookseller uh, or a printer uh, so that they could then go ahead and sell it. And um, that's something that to always keep in mind in this. They probably wouldn't have viewed many of the things that we see tonight as mistakes. It was just part of their work. Um, we're dealing uh, almost exclusively with the 19th century here. And uh, at least in the first half of the 19th century, the, the idea of you know, machine-made goods or goods that were striving to be perfect, uh, it just really didn't exist. And so we shouldn't judge them against that. And yet, of course, that's exactly what I'll be doing. Now, the other thing, um, the reason that I wanted to use this particular image um, to start us off tonight, this album, is because you sometimes have to be a little bit of a detective to figure out what's actually the mistake here, what's really going on. Now, clearly, um, the way that the album is situated right now with the kind of stronger title at the top was the way that it was first titled. And then afterwards, I think the initials of someone who had purchased it were added to it. But who made the mistake? When we look at it like this, we think obviously the person that put the initials on made the mistake. But if we turn it around and look at the clasps, which um, typically have a, a way of opening, where the post would be on the front board, the class part would be on the back board, we can see that the person who put the initials on the front board was correct in this case. So the arrow is pointing to the, the post. And so that person probably looked at the class, put the book down the way he knows it's supposed to open, and then did the initials, and then realized I need to retitle this book, um, which was probably done at the same bindery. Um, just at a later date, maybe by another person, maybe by the same person, because you can see that the, um, the title that's used there is the same. So it wasn't the second person that, that made the mistake. It was really the first person that titled it originally. So sometimes we have to kind of tease out what's going on um, with these mistakes. You know, when would they have occurred? Why did they occur? Um, what's it really telling us? So for the presentation tonight, I've organized the mistakes into two broad categories. And the first one I'm calling honest bookbinding mistakes. Uh, I'm sure if you've ever done any binding, as I have done, you have made an honest mistake. Um, if you're me, you've made many, many honest mistakes. And I've broken those down into two types. One is the first one, flaws in materials. We all buy materials. We're lucky that the sponsors of this conference provide us with great materials, but they didn't always have fantastic materials in the 19th century. And we really shouldn't hold it against a bookbinder 
if there was a mistake in the material that they were using. And then the second um, category under those mistakes, honest mistakes, would be ones that the binder just made. He just, you know, it made a mistake, which we all do. And then the second part of the talk, I'll be talking about things that were purposefully done that we might see as mistakes, um, but they were really done on purpose. And I've broken those into three basic categories, um, some kind of change that happened between the production of the text and the production of the binding. Then the second category would be corrections to some problems that they encountered. So trying to fix a mistake. And then the last category would be alterations to bindings. Now I know bindings can be altered at any time. I could alter a 19th century binding today, but I'm specifically looking at alterations to bindings before they ever sold. So these would be alterations um, at the behest of probably the publisher or bookseller. So those are how I've organized the talk tonight. And so first, flaws in materials. So I've put an arrow um, onto the lower right-hand front board of this binding, where we can see that there are two uh, holes in the leather that they've patched with other pieces of leather. And this was not uncommon um, at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. Leather was fairly scarce and they had shortages of leather at, at different time periods in the 18th century and even into the 19th century. Um, there was only so much leather, only so many animals, and uh, specifically in the beginning of the 19th century, they start ramping up production of texts for various reasons, and uh, they, they just need more leather. And so they're using um, maybe poor quality skins in, in some instances. Here they've done a tree calf staining to it to try to cover up those holes. So they've done a pretty good job at that. Um, the tree calf staining also makes this look more like calf. When, when it's actually sheep, you can see on the backboard some of the delaminating um, that's characteristic of sheep. And it, it was not uncommon at all for them to treat sheep um, to make it look like calf and then actually advertise it as calf and sell it as calf. So this is just a, a flaw in the material that we really can't fault the bookbinder for at all, except if it was me, I probably would have tried to put that on the backboard instead of the front board. But it just wasn't a big consideration for them. So why wasn't it more of a consideration for them? Apart from the, the fact that they weren't dealing with a, um, a buying public that was used to perfectly made goods, they were, you know, they were mostly handmade goods at the time period and people ex accepted those craft goods with their flaws. There was also a lot of financial pressure on bookbinders. So this broadside was basically a list of prices that bookbinders had to meet. Um, it's dated 1822. Um, it probably is more for the New York area, but other areas of the country, bookbinders were dictated to what price they would get for their binding work. Where it's a little foreign to us today, we think, well, certainly the person doing the work is going to set the price they really kind of had a stranglehold on bookbinders. And you can see, um, even though you, you can't really, you know, drill into every one of the little categories, there's a category for everything here. They've thought of every possible thing and then they've given a, uh, a cost for that that a bookbinder could charge. So a bookbinder was really forced into being as economical as possible, as frugal with his materials as they could be, and they really had to produce. And on top of that, on top of being told how much you could charge for something, they were also told how quickly they would get paid. So I've highlighted with an arrow, uh, you know, a small section of this broadside terms of payment. And basically, if you were charging someone more than $30, which would be easy enough for a bookbinder to charge a, a publisher or a bookseller, then you had to wait 90 days from the completion and return of the work to get paid any money. And if you had a running account with you know, a publisher that you were working with constantly, uh, then you had the, the publisher had three months from the commencement of that running account to start making payments to you. So not, not only did they have the, the, the pressure of having to 
work towards a particular price for everything that they did, but they also weren't going to get paid for it for a quarter of a year. Now, right above that arrow, the sentence above that, for boarded work, the paper for the backs and sides is to be furnished by the bookseller. This is another material that they didn't have control over. So on this particular um, book from 1835, the cover paper was supplied by the publisher. So in the upper right-hand corner, the flaw that you're seeing in this paper was not through any fault of the bookbinder. This was, again, some of the supplies that they got uh, was in this case misprinted. So if we take a close up look at this, this had a crease in the paper or a fold in the paper at the time that it was printed. And when the book binder applied adhesive to it and let it relax and smoothed it down on the front cover very carefully as a book binder will do, then the crease came out of the paper and we can see the misprinting here. So again, not the book binder's fault. The book binder actually did a good job to get that piece of paper smooth and get the crease out of it. But now it's, it's showing that it's flawed. But again, it was, you know, it was good enough. I'm sure no one said, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to buy this book because it has this problem with it. So often the marbled paper would be supplied by a bookseller or a publisher as well. And in, in this marbled paper, you can see at the very top, there's a, you know, a pretty large flaw. The bookbinder, you know, tried their best to move it as close to the edge as they could. But again, they're going to try to use every bit of this expensive material that they can. I, I suppose there's another flaw on the right where um, running vertically where maybe a tooth grabs something. And so instead of being a very fine comb, one tooth ends up being, you know, fairly wide. Even on the back board of this book, uh, the marble paper has a flaw and I, I love this flaw because it comes out in a nice kind of heart shape. So uh, I made the paper look a little more pink in, in areas The the two are, are pretty much an exact match except for the flaws in it. So again, something the bookbinder was issued had a problem with it. It's nothing they could really do. And in other materials, flaws show up. So this is a, um, a binding from the early 1860s and the cloth um, had a, uh, a thread that was running through it that for some reason didn't take the adhesive very well. This wasn't something that um, got uh, stained or faded afterwards. This was at the time of the manufacturer. If you look closely at it, you can see it's just this one piece that seemed to resist the coloration. So it was in that cloth before it was colored and before it was sized for bookbinding and before it was grained um, with this very fine grain. This was an expensive English cloth. And so they either didn't notice the flaw when they were making the cases or um, they just didn't worry that much about it. And here are two more examples of uh, cloth issues. So a, a really wide thread on the left, which the arrow is pointing to the, the lamp of the sanctuary. Um, you know, for whatever reason, a, a wider thread got into the weave of the cloth. And so it's very noticeable now. And on the right, this is a kind of a specially grained cloth. And it would have been put through two rollers or sometimes one roller with a design and another roller that was just flat. And like the paper that we saw earlier, it developed a crease in it as it went through those rollers. And so then the design got put in a little, um, a little differently. And so you can see that crease, there's a long crease that the arrow is pointing to, and then up above it is another kind of smaller crease um, that you can see in the, in the top right hand corner. Now, that was an expensive piece of cloth because you're doing another treatment to it. So of course they're going to use it um, because no one is really going to mind that much. No one's probably going to notice it uh, except for another book binder or you know, conservator or somebody like that. So they just use this material. Now, to me, this is a little bit more noticeable. And when you first look at it in the upper left-hand corner, this sewn repair to the um, cloth, I would assume was done afterwards, that there's some kind of problem with this. 
and that um, you know it got damaged at some point and someone sewed this back up. But if we look at a detail of it, we can see that it's actually been stamped over that sewn repair. So that means that it was in the cloth when they put it onto the book before they ever stamped it, before they ever put that case onto the text block. So at least the person who was stamping it did the right thing and used it as the backboard as opposed to using it on the front more, you know, kind of pictorial board with that, you know, lovely creature that's on there that people are going to look at. So they did a good job with that, but it does make you wonder, you know, why did they use this? Um, did someone take the time to sew up this piece of cloth so they could use it, which I tend to doubt, although it's possible. I don't know for a certainty, but my guess would be that when this roll of cloth was manufactured, there was some kind of split in the edge. They thought, well, we better sew this up because otherwise it will travel and it will ruin more of the cloth. And then they either just didn't notice or just didn't care when they use it. Now this has a history. Um, this is a leather binding, which has the same kind of treatment to it. Um, it's at the top of the spine. It's not quite as noticeable. Um, so you, you will find these kind of sewn repairs to materials before they're used. And here I'm pointing an arrow to where it crosses the, the back joint and enlarging the whole um, sewn aspect of it. Now, because they put a, you know, kind of a tree calf pattern, a staining on this leather again, like the one we saw earlier, it, it blends that sewing in. You can see the stain darkens some of the thread. Some of it remains a little white um, right next to the top of the title. Um, so would anyone have really noticed this or if, would they have cared? You know, probably not so much um, if they ended up noticing at all. But so there is a history of this kind of, you know, sewn repair onto covering material. I just don't see it much with cloth. Um, you don't see as many flaws in cloth as you do in leather. And here's another covering material issue. It's not a binder issue. So this um, is two volumes of a 10 volume set of the, the works of uh, Robert Southey, Southey's poetical works. Um, this is actually a London um, imprint, and I'll show you some uh, English books in this as well. You know, it's, they, they have very much uh, a, uh, a carryover with American things. Um, because it's a 10 volume set, not every volume is going to be exactly the same width in the spine because there'll be different numbers of pages. And so if you have one that's very thin, as you see on the left, and another that's much thicker on the right, the design, the overall design of the covering cloth is going to be different on those two books. This is what's called pre-ornamented cloth. Um, Jennifer Rosner at the library company has done an article about this. They actually have most of the designs in a Flickr uh, account on their website uh, that you can find. And so this was done before it was ever put on the book. Only the gold title is done afterwards. So for the binder, he has to try to center all of this stuff. So it's got to be centered uh, head to tail and then has to be centered on the spine. And because the one on the right is thicker, uh, it takes up more of the design with the spine. And you can see the uh, board edges on the right look pretty good. You know, it's maybe a little high if you look at the bottom and the top, but then the foredge looks fine. and it's not very noticeable. But where I've marked it with an arrow on the backboard, because that spine didn't take up as much of the design, it kept running over and off of the book. So it's really not anything that the binder could have done anything about, unless maybe he thought to put extra pages into the text block to make it wider. Um, so again, it's a flaw in the material. It's not something we should really, uh, or maybe a flaw in the concept, which is why this type of binding only lasted for a few years and then kind of faded out. It's, it's not the bookbinder's fault. So let's look at some kind of more honest mistakes. And so we're going to start off with text block mistakes. Um, and I wouldn't really call this particular knot a mistake. It's, it's not the prettiest knot I've ever seen. But of course, a lot of times you'll run out of thread as you're sewing a book and you'll need to cast on or tie on another piece of thread so that you can finish the sewing. Now, when I first looked 
at this, besides thinking eh, it's not the prettiest knot I've ever seen, I also thought, boy, this poor woman who was sewing this book, she was an inch away from having enough thread to finish. And I thought that because I'm always sewing books, mostly one off. I, I'm very rarely sewing, you know, multiple copies of a book. It's just not something that I do. But in this case, she probably was. Uh, and here is an illustration, a 19th century illustration of women sewing. And she would have sewn many, many copies of this book. So instead of just casting on, you know, a, a small piece of thread just to finish up that last hole in the book, she's just putting on another long piece of thread and carrying on sewing. And she's gonna sew as many books as she comfortably can on her frame and then move those up to the top of the frame and then uh, start another stack underneath because she doesn't wanna waste time breaking down a frame and setting up another frame very often. She's most likely paid uh, by the piece, which means every text block she sews, she's going to get paid for that. So for any extra time that she spends not sewing text blocks, she's not making any money. So at the end, once she's filled this frame up, she'll slightly separate the books so that she can leave a little bit of the, the sewing supports on each side and then cut them all out and then she's done. So it wasn't really a mistake by this person who was sewing that particular book. It's just you know, what they had to do. Now this would be a mistake. This is a catalog that was bound in at the back of a book, uh, the back of the Convent Bell in 1846. And they actually bound in two copies of the catalog. So the person who was sewing it, unfortunately sewed an extra signature that they didn't get paid for on this book. And, but it wasn't really their fault. They're probably not paying that much attention. Um, they're working long hours, poor lighting, six days a week probably if they're working full time, if there's enough work for them. Um, so she's just sewing along and she didn't happen to notice that she'd already sewn this catalog in at the back. This is actually a mistake by another person, not the person sewing it, but the person who's gathering all of these signatures together. And even though this image isn't from the 19th century, this is probably how the person who is gathering those text blocks, the one that we just saw sewn, is doing that work. And it would have probably looked a lot like this, huge piles of signatures, and she has to go around and collect one from each one of the piles. And if there's a thousand copies of that book printed, she has to do that a thousand different times, literally walking miles every day as she's going around the stacks pulling sheets off. So you could see it would be easy enough for her to miss one from one of the piles or grab two from one of the piles instead of just grabbing one. Now I don't see a lot of these mistakes because I'm not reading the books from the 19th century, I'm mostly looking at the bindings. But sometimes they do pop out at you. So on the left, we have the, the title page of volume six of The Mother's Assistant which was a periodical put out monthly. And it's supposed to have January, 1845 to June, 1845. But instead on the right-hand side, we can see that it includes February of 1846, which is part of volume eight, as opposed to February of 1845, which is an, again, an easy enough mistake to make a lot of times, uh, these periodicals would include a title page with the end of a volume, and then people will, would have saved their copies and taken them to a binder and had them bind them. And it's easy enough that the person taking it to the binder might have made a mistake, or um, at the bindery they, they could have made a mistake, but I don't think that's what happened in this case. Here um, we see the title from the cloth binding that's on this book, and it was actually volume six and volume seven bound together. So basically the full year of 1845 bound together, which ran through January of 1846 for some reason. And at the end of the year, they, they probably had a bunch of extra monthly issues laying around. And so they thought, well, we'll bind these up and we'll sell them as a book. Um, you know, things didn't go out of um, 
usefulness as quickly then as information does today. And so it's something that they, you know, they often did. And because they were doing it in February of 1846 with, um, you know, trying to include January's issue, they somehow mistakenly grabbed a February of 1846 in place of a February of 1845. But again, the, the type of binding tells me that it was done at the publisher because this is a title stamp that's stamped on a cloth case. This isn't something that a normal bookbinder would do if you took your issues of the mother's assistant to them. Uh, so next I wanna move to, as I said, I don't have a lot of examples of uh, text block mistakes, but trimming mistakes a little easier to see. Uh, you don't have to look through all the pages and everything else. And clearly on this book, they just chopped off um, too much of the foredge and they've, they've lost part of the, the type. Now that was a common thing to have happen in earlier centuries because those off cuts of the paper, a bookbinder would sell to a paper maker uh, and it could be very lucrative at that time. They could still do that uh, in the mid 19th century, but it wasn't quite as uh, lucrative as it would have been in earlier centuries. So this is um, the acts passed by the 14th Congress of the United States. It was issued in 1817. Um, and what I'm showing you is the front cover and it's a paper wrapper. It wasn't that thick. And on the right hand side, if you look at the bottom, it's very uh, a very even cut and it's very close to the text where the top, you can see that there's a gap that the wrapper doesn't quite make. And then there's a lot of extra room above the type um, on the text page. And that's because they were supposed to cut off the head of the book. And for some reason, the bookbinder made a mistake and cut off the tail of the book. Now, since this was 1817, they would have been doing this with a plow. And instead of putting one book in the plow the way a bookbinder might today, if they were doing it, um, at least in a non-commercial way, the, the way that I would do it, they were probably trying to put as many of these books in as they could at one time. They could maybe fit 10. You can see how long the screws of the press are that um, he's using there. And so it'd be easy enough to get one of those flipped around and you could see how that could happen. The problem that it really leads to is this was um, printed in, uh, in a quarto format. So the printed sheet was folded, folded once horizontally. So the top was folded down on the bottom and then it was folded vertically. And that vertical fold creates the um, spine folds that the bookbinder would sew through. And the horizontal fold creates a part where the page doesn't want to open. So this should have been trimmed at the top, which would have cut those um, folds and allowed someone to read the book. And instead, um, those were never cut. And fortunately, since it was you know, a, a fairly dry book, like the Axe Pass by the 14th Congress of the United States, no one ever bothered to open it and look at it. Now, here are two more examples. One where it's cut off at the, on the left-hand side, uh, cut off at the bottom and the one on the right hand side the the publisher's advertisements which were inserted at the back of the volume are actually kind of cut off and we're losing part of the Appleton name there. Um, so in in the 1840s or 1850s these were probably being cut by you know I, I can't say definitely but they were most likely being cut by a guillotine. Uh, so the guillotine was introduced into American binaries in many American binders in the 1830s, and then by the 1840s, it's, it's becoming much more um, much more common. Um, so we can see a guillotine on the right here, and of course a board shear on the left. Uh, and this is from an 1855 publication. So they would stack a whole bunch of books up in the guillotine and cut them all down. So it would be easy for one of the books to get kind of just jogged slightly out one way or another, or maybe you turn it in the wrong direction again so that you're cutting the tail for the second time, or you, you know, you're know you cutting the head when you think you're cutting the tail. So it's easy enough to see how that could all happen. 
um, using a guillotine. And here's a, uh, just one more example, and I'm showing with an arrow where the, the date has been almost cut off this book. And this is a slightly unusual, more squarish format. And so it might have given the bookbinder uh, problems. And it's, it's also interesting to think when the text block was trimmed, was it trimmed after the cases were made or before the cases were made and the cases were made to that? A lot of times, in case binding, you have these two parallel paths. The text block is going through one path being prepared. The case is going through another path being prepared. And then at the end, they're being put together. And you can take one of any of the hundreds of cases you've made and one of any of the hundreds of text blocks you've made and put them together. So slight flaws in either one can lead to a problem like this. So it might have been that this person was trying to cut this text block down to a case size that they had already made. And so what this does in some books is lead to problems. Um, and the arrow is pointing to uh, a text block that was trimmed too much for this case. And we have a, you know, a really, really wide foredge. And I like big squares on books. So you know, I'm not um, judging the person on that, but this is kind of a, a really big one. There seems to be a mistake here. In fact, you can even see part of the board right where the arrow is pointing to it. So it was definitely a mistake in how much this text block was trimmed. And I think in this particular case, the arrow is pointing to the fore edge again. And we're looking at this from the, the top of the book, the head of the book, because I wanted to show you this marbled edge treatment, um, which is, very, very unusual for a cloth binding. Cloth bindings in the mid 19th century, this is 1855 Boston, just are almost never um, treated with a marble edge on the text block. I, you know, it just wasn't something that was done. So it makes me think that there's something else going on with this book. And when we look at the, you know, the turn ins, they're pretty much even all the way around. It isn't just that it got trimmed more at the fore edge, but you can see that the top edge of the book and even the tail edge, which I, I don't have an arrow pointing to, are quite a bit larger. And so I think that this was maybe a text block that was um, forwarded for a different type of binding. Because normally if you're seeing this kind of marbled text edge, you're talking about a leather binding not a paper binding, not a cloth binding. And a lot of books at this time period were coming out in you know, several different types of bindings. You, you didn't just have a cloth binding or even just a cloth binding and a paper binding. So I, I'm showing you a page, uh, actually one entry from the cost books of Tickner and Fields. Um, these aren't the actual manuscript cost books, but um, this is um, a publication uh, where the authors had have transcribed all this stuff and kind of figured everything out for you and cleaned it all up so you can easily read it. And this particular binding in 1847 or book text in 1847, you could get in five different bindings. So there's uh, the arrows pointing to the five bindings, a, a dark paper binding, which would have been a kind of a grayish uh, nondescript binding, and then a glazed paper binding, which would have been a yellow colored paper, then a plain, plain cloth binding, which is probably brown, uh, cloth gilt binding, which probably had some kind of center stamp gilt on it. And then the cloth plain extra, which was the most expensive book, um, that would have probably been an, you know, an overall gilt binding. So the text block of this to produce, to buy the paper, to set the type, to do the printing, to pay the copyright in this case, because it's Longfellow. So that's, you know, the biggest cost out of the $570 to do the text block, you know, 2,100 copies of the text block, $400 is going to Longfellow. So he's getting the, the largest share of the cost of producing the text block. But to produce one of the text blocks was about 27 cents, a little over 27 cents. So the entire cost of 33 cents for the paper bindings was only about six cents for the binding itself. So the plain cloth binding was 14 cents. And then you find that the 
cloth gilt extra, the most expensive cloth binding was, um, was 37 cents. So it's, it's almost, uh, it's, it's approaching three times the cost of the plain cloth binding, which would have only had a, um, a gold spine. So that's telling you how much the gold really adds to the price of the binding. But because they were doing all these different kinds of bindings, sometimes they would do, you know, fancier leather bindings on the same text block um, or cheaper leather bindings. Uh, so I think when you see a marbled cloth text edge, uh, not marble cloth, excuse me, a marbled um, edge on the, the paper text block, it was probably intended for a different book. And here again, you can see the, the squares at the fore edge, even though I, I don't have an arrow pointing to it, they just seem too big for this book. And in fact, they probably, if you've seen a lot of, of cloth bindings from the 19th century, this marbled edge probably just seems a little weird to you. And again, when we look at the the fore edge of the case, it's really large. In fact, so large that the arrow is pointing to one of the corners where the, the, the paper of the paste down doesn't really cover it. So again, I think this text block was probably meant for another binding. They might have you know, needed more cloth bindings or they had more cloth cases that they needed to use up. And so they just used that text block. I don't think it was ever intended to be in this binding. And the one nice thing about this cloth corner coming up is we can see that the cloth was never clipped at the corners. So there's two arrows, one is pointing to an inner fold and the top one is pointing to an outer fold because the cloth was never clipped. They'd have to turn in part of the cloth and then turn in the rest of the cloth. And so that creates two folds and this kind of unclipped corner seems fairly unique to Boston. Um, you don't really see them in Philadelphia. You don't really see them in New York. You see them more in Boston in the 1830s, um, but it doesn't surprise me that in 1854, you're seeing a, a, a corner that was never clipped on a Boston uh, text block. So let's move on to end papers now. Um, and this has, this particular book from 1847, it's actually a two volume set, um, has really wonderful end papers. And this is the end papers top and bottom on the left-hand side of one of the volumes. And you can see in the details on the right, um, on, the, on the right, on the left is the front uh, paste down and on the, the right, right is the rear paste down that they folded this sheet of paper. It didn't, you know, it didn't have enough design to cover the whole thing, but again, they're trying to use the materials that they have. And so you wind up with this blank, unprinted part of the paper. And I think this gives us a, a good indication of the size of the sheet of paper because where that blank space is lines up perfectly for a binder folding the sheet in half and then cutting it in half to use half in the front and half in the back. So sometimes we can get a better sense of the materials that they use and how this was really just a printed sheet of paper. Um, so of course, they're, if the publisher gives them paper, you know, decorative paper for the end papers, they're gonna use that. If they're using their own paper, if the publisher doesn't give them paper, generally they're not providing a blank page with the text block, they're gonna to try to use that as sparingly as possible. And maybe the person who sewed the end papers on, you know, folded and sewed the end papers on, didn't realize that this text block wasn't gonna be cut down enough um, to get rid of that rough edge of the paper. And so um, the arrows pointing to um, the area that's detailed on the right. And you can see again, part of the board um, that's just not covered up by the paste down. And you do see, you know, quite a number of examples of this, you know, here, the arrow on the bottom left is, is pointing to the uncovered board uh, where it just wasn't trimmed enough at the bottom. You see them a lot more in the 1830s. And then this starts to kind of go away, you know, especially as you're, you know, trimming things with guillotines and um, as they're just producing more and more of these, is these, of these bindings.
and there's just a detail of it where you can see that, um, you know, along with the, the board showing the, the paste down being too short, it seems like they clipped too much of the corner. And, you know, even if that corner was perfect, it's damaged now, uh, it looks like there would be a gap in the middle of it. So, you know, this has a lot of different issues going on. And again, it's probably they're just working very quickly. You can see the number of um, booksellers who are selling this particular book at the bottom of the title page. So it's published by Stimson and Clapp, but then it's sold by all these other people in Albany and Portland and Baltimore and Philadelphia. So they probably put out a big run of this, um, you know, a popular type of, of school book. Now the next, um, and this is a very short um, category, but I'm, I'm calling warehouse damage. And again, I, I was saying that text blocks could be made in one kind of production stream, cases made in another production stream, and then you'd bring them together. And so sometimes you might make, you know, more text blocks than you need right now, because for whatever reason, they just got caught up in that production or you had um, people working on them and you just made more than you had text blocks, uh, more text blocks than you had bindings for. And so the text blocks would sit around for a while. So I have arrows pointing at the bottom to where the text block got damaged before it was cased in. You see the same identical damage on the right and the left, um, but the cloth at the corner is not really damaged at all. So I would expect if I'm seeing this much paper damage in this detail, then that cloth is really going to be worn. So this was damage that occurred to the text block before the person ever cased it in. And it probably happened because the text block sat around for a while. Um, I don't think it's because the end sheet material that they used sat around for a while because they would have protected it better. Now on the left, you can see the title page for this book and on the right is the, um, the case. And this is not dated. It's published in Rutland, Vermont. Um, it's got a very decorative title page. Um, it, it's a pretty nice binding too with the big pictorial stamp of the, the boat on it. It probably was a bit of a slow seller because it was in you know, rural Vermont or at least you know, more rural Vermont than Boston or New York or Philadelphia. And it seems to be an expensive publication because of the binding and the title page. And so this was probably purposely undated. It doesn't have a date anywhere. We're calling it circa 1876 because of the uh, inscription on it. There's a dated inscription, 1876. It, it could have been produced six years earlier than that, five years earlier than that. I don't know. But they could have sold it over a number of years because it was not dated. It wouldn't go out of date at all. So that's probably the reason why you have that damage. Although that being said, um, the binders were not clean, neat places to, to work. Um, here you can see there are a couple of women in bonnets on the left-hand side. They're touring this bindery. I don't know how often that ever happened. Um, but everything looks clean and neat. The piles of um, text blocks that are sitting behind this guy who's is sawing the grooves in for the uh, sewing supports. Uh, very neat. Everything looks really clean. But that whole group of women in the back kind of alludes to what a bindery would actually look like. Oh, excuse me. So in this, again, it's a photo from the early 20th century, but this is probably what that bindery actually looked like, where the women were working. You have piles and piles of books. You have workers jammed into a space. You have poor lighting conditions and things could easily get damaged, um, you know, at any point of its production, but certainly after a text block had been sewn and was waiting for a case. So the fact that you can find damage like this, um, where the top of this text block was, was really beat up before it was ever cased into the case, um, you can see there, there's nothing really wrong in the case on the left, but it has the same exact damage to the paste down that you see to the rest of the text block on the right. Um, that really is showing you that 
this was damage that occurred before it was cased in. And also that they thought, hey, this is fine. You know, let's, we'll case this in and we'll give it back to the publisher, the bookseller, and they'll sell it and everything's good. So that's, again, kind of where the good enough in the title comes from. So I want to move to covering uh, mistakes now. Um, and obviously I see more of, of this type of mistake because it's on the outside of a binding. I don't have to look through the binding itself. So here on the back board, you see an arrow pointing to a wrinkle and there are several wrinkles on that back board um, that happened during covering. Now, again, the person who stamped this was smart enough to place them on the backboard. But again, this is a mistake that happens. And you'll see more of these mistakes in the 30s. Um, 1834 on the left, 1836 on the right, because it's an unfamiliar material for them. You know, cloth gets introduced as a covering material into some bindaries in the 1820s, mid 1820s, late 1820s in America. But then it starts to really become much more prominent in the 1830s. But again, they're just not used to working with it. And you also have uh, two different constructions of bindings in this. So I can kind of forgive the binding on the left having a wrinkle in it because those boards were attached to the text block before it was covered. It's not a case binding. So the person's dealing with some wet, limp piece of cloth with a bunch of glue on it and they're trying to manipulate the boards and do the turn-ins at the head and tail. Um, and so, you know, quite understandably, they get a crease in the front and they're not going to worry about it. And the leather label is kind of a dead giveaway that it's not a case binding. Uh, they couldn't stamp it. Um, so they had to put some kind of a label on and here, you know, they're, they're probably used to working with leather. They're used to tooling leather. So they put a leather label on it. On the right, it's a little harder to understand not only the, the big wrinkle that's going across the board, but also the one on the spine above the uh, title. This was a case binding. So this person is, is working with you know, two boards, a spine stiffener and a piece of cloth that they can just have flat on the table. And the way that we know that it's a case binding, or at least we assume that it's a case binding is because it's stamped with a gold title. So they shouldn't have this kind of problem. Here's another um, book that it's not a case binding. Uh, and we can see they had all kinds of problems with this piece of cloth. I'm, I'm sure this bookbinder probably wanted to give up after they covered this book. So again, it's an unfamiliar material. They're using it for the, you know, not necessarily the first time, but they're trying to get used to how they're going to work with it. And they're being asked to cover a book the same way that they would have covered a leather book, which, you know, was kind of limp and, and somewhat difficult to work with when it was wet, but it also was much more forgiving and stretchable where the cloth was not. Now, I talked about the pressures that these binderies were under. Uh, and they were trying to churn out as many books as they possibly could at one time. So this is a newspaper ad from 1835. And this bindery is turning out from 1,000 to 1,300 books uh, a day, which is a huge amount to do. So we can understand how they're getting wrinkles in the cloth um, when they're trying to put out 1,000 books. Um, they're only employing 40 people who are doing the folding, they're doing the gathering, they're doing the sewing, they're doing the case making, they're doing the stamping, they're doing the casing in, everything in one day. So this idea that these books were being produced, you know, in these kind of small shops and this guy is doing a little bit of forwarding and then doing a little bit of covering and then doing a little bit of titling it is just not accurate for the larger binderies. They are huge factories. Um, if you can call 40 people huge, that are turning out, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books every single day to meet the demands of the publishers and booksellers. And so that's why you see, you know, these kinds of mistakes. So here, the cover paper that was put on the marble paper on this cloth um, 
spine binding. It's not too bad, but then the one on the back is quite angled. Um, so you wind up with, you know, much more narrow spot at the spine at the bottom where the arrow is pointing to versus the um, amount of cloth that's visible on the other side. So it's just a, you know, they're working fast. And it's particularly problematic, um, like the pre-ornamented cloth that we saw before, if there's a design already on the covering um, cloth or paper that you're trying to put down. Here, they, they did a pretty good job with the front board. The spine's a little off, especially at the top. And because the, the this, I believe this is a, a paper that's backed with some cloth, it almost runs off the backboard at the top. It's probably stretching, it's moving. Um, it's, it's really difficult, especially because the design is away from them. They're not looking at the design when they're covering. They may see a hint of it on the back, but they're, they're trying the best that they can. Now they're using some, some jigs. Um, so the man in the foreground is using a jig to make a case where he can set the width of the spine. And then he's got the little pieces of metal that he can lay the boards up against, which give him an exact um, kind of joint area. And in the background, a man is, is pre-cutting materials with a rotary cutter. So he can just slide board through that and it, it cuts them into very exact pieces. So they're using some material, uh, some machinery to help them, assist them do this, but it's still handwork. And so particularly with the covering, um, Again, he's not able to see the design if there's the design on it. So you're going to see mistakes. And here, um, I've opened up the front board. It's kind of pointed straight at you to be able to show you that the covering paper is put on the backboard. And so it's actually upside down to the text. Now, I would blame this on the person who did the covering paper, but there's also a, a gold tool title on that leather spine, which the person probably did before they put the cover paper on. So the person who was putting the cover paper on was just following what the person did for the title. But the end result is that the book's kind of bound backwards. And, and here's one where they got the front cover board on a, it's a cloth spine and then kind of a semi-limp paper boards. They, they got the the front cover right and the back cover is wrong, which is very unfortunate for not only the bookstore um, that they're advertising at the top, but also if you look about two thirds of the way down, it's a book bindery connected with the bookstore. So they screwed up their own advertising here. And here's a scale board binding um, with an arrow pointed at one of the sewing supports, which um, was used to attach the boards first before covering. And so again, whoever put the cover paper on here just had the book flipped around. Um, and so this is the best way to kind of show you that um, it's bound backwards or the cover paper was put on the wrong board is by having the board facing you. Um, so it's just a simple mistake that they made. And this is a, a covering mistake, not a casing in mistake because the boards were already attached. Now, another kind of covering mistake is this corner um, that was clipped off that got um, caught underneath the paste down. Um, normally I would think, well, when they case this in, they might've seen it, or this person was making a case. Couldn't he just see that piece of, of corner that got clipped there? Even though the book is from 1841, this is actually a, um, a board that was attached to the text block before they covered it. So he's trying to manipulate all this, clip the corners, do the turn-ins with the text block um, already attached to that binding. And so it's easy enough to have a corner just kind of get stuck in there. So whoever put the paste down up should have probably caught that and didn't. Um, some title mistakes. Again, this is probably not a mistake. The first quarter of the 19th century, they tooled the title and you know they, they did what they did and they did it quick and this is what they got. Now this is very similar in that the title is, is off quite, um, quite a bit tilted to the right. And we would think, oh, couldn't they have stamped this better? But I think this was also tooled. Um, even though it has a hollow spine, the arrow is pointing to a piece of paper 
that was applied to the cloth after it was glued up and it was left a little long so they could see it um, when they started to cover the book. So the boards again were attached to this book and so it had to be tooled afterwards. And there was no reason that the tooling would work any better on this book than it would work on the one that we saw just before. Here's another one um, with a pre-ornamented cloth binding. So the, the cloth was already treated with this design before it was covered. Again, it is an inboards binding. It's not a case binding. So this would have had to have been tooled afterwards. And you could see they just kind of missed the mark on this one. And in fact, with the arrows, I'm kind of showing that there was a, a nice placement for it. You know, this blank space in the design that they should have been able to get, but um, it just was not very good um, titling by this person. Um, this is an error, uh, an error in titling at the bottom under the volume three, JMS should be JMS because it's Joel Munsell's sons, not Joel Munsell and son. So, you know, this was just a very simple mistake that I would make. I could totally see myself making that, just thinking Joel Munsell's and sons. This is one that they noticed and someone wrote right on the front fly leaf in, you know, big graphite pencil that they could erase once they fixed it, correct error in titling. But this went out without that error being corrected. No one ever erased this, you know, kind of criticism and, and, and that they wanted corrected. And so it's, it's still there today. Um, this is another book that was titled upside down. So it wasn't a cover paper that was put on it. I couldn't really show this one with the board open. So you just have to trust me. So they did sometimes tool the entire book upside down, unfortunately. And nothing really looks wrong with this when you look at it until you remember that this is an American book and the title is running from the bottom to the top, which we just don't do in America. That's very much a, a European thing. And so I think this label was put on probably by a recent European immigrant or someone who is used to titling the other way. And in this detail of the title, you can see that the price is on the paper label 10 cents and it's upside down. So this was meant to go in the other direction and most probably was a European immigrant who, who made the mistake. Although I don't know that for a fact. Now I see a lot of stamping mistakes obviously because I look at the outsides of the bindings. Here you can see the title on the spine is in the correct orientation, but the boards are stamped with a pictorial stamp. It's in blind so it's hard to see. So I'm pointing to the head of a boy and you can see he's, he's upside down, uh, is meant to be the other way. So someone probably stamped the gold title first and then the blind afterwards or vice versa and one person just didn't notice. Now there were often these kind of askewed titles um, that were stamped. You know, you would have needed a stamping press to do the blind work here. So I'm sure that the title was probably done um, with a stamping press. It's the working of the stamping press that lets you understand why this is, is so easy to do. So this person uh, on the right is, uh, and that's 1855, is dealing with a press that's bringing the board up. And there's a lot of pressure there. If he gets his fingers caught in there, he's going to lose those fingers. And there were instances of, of people losing fingers in binderies, in stamping presses. So I have a little arrow at the top of the illustration on the right that's pointing to the belt drive. And so this was turning continuously. Um, he needed to take a case out, put another case in every five seconds. It's stamped 12 times a minute. And you think, well, that's plenty of time to do that, but you could easily get something that didn't go in quite right against the, the stops on the left-hand side and you're just gonna pull your fingers out of there and let what happens to the case happen. So here on the, the left is the blind stamping from the back board of a book. On the right is the gold stamping, which got stamped twice. The, the person obviously got distracted, didn't get the case out in time. It just got stamped a second time and you can see a kind of a doubling of everything. And here the same is true on this book. Uh, the front board is doubled where the back board just has one clean hit. 
The same on this leather book. So this would have been a, a case binding as well, even though it was leather. And you can see in this um, detail of the center die that um, it's just doubled on the right. Funny that those last ones were all on the front board. And here are two more examples. Um, you can see that there shouldn't be two, uh, two of the, the characters on the left-hand one. And you can see the doubling of the weather vane on the right. So you can see a lot of these. Um, and you also see mistakes on the spines because they would have to stamp the spine as well. So the life of Colby on the left, it's stamped a little off to one side. And on the right, it's crooked. And you can see the M in monument actually kind of cuts into the back board because it was, it was stamping a thinner material. And then I have an arrow at the bottom where it's missing part of the gold. Um, and that's a mistake that you see sometimes because a gold really was a costly material and they were trying to use as little of it as possible. So when they put the gold on this cover, they're putting just enough for the spine and then they're trying to put it exactly on the front and back board where the, the little um, pictorial stamp is going to go. And on the front board, it's really quite off. So if we look at just the front board of itself on the left, we can see it's stamped way over to the, to the right and probably a little low. And then I've put an arrow onto that image and you can see there's a little dent. And then on the detail on the right, you can also see that dent. And I think that dent was for laying the gold leaf. And then once the gold leaf is on, the person who is stamping the cover or tooling the cover, it could have possibly been tooled. It's small enough that they could have somehow tooled it. They have to follow that gold. And so here's the detail of the back cover and you see that same little dot again. That's something that Sue Allen noticed a long time ago and thought that that was for laying gold leaf so that they could get it very exact. Um, here is a full gilt binding. Again, this binding is gonna cost two and a half to three times what one stamp with just a gold spine would cost. And so you have to put a lot of gold on here and on the left upper board and the right board, they miss some spots. So I have arrows pointing on the left-hand side to the little tiny bit that they missed on the, the backboard. And then the front board detail, you can see there's a blind stamp there. There just was no gold where it's stamped. So they just didn't get enough gold over this whole surface. And for bigger books, they would have to use several you know, pieces of gold. Gold came in two different sizes at that time. One was the size that you know, we're familiar with, you know, kind of a three by five size or maybe a four by five size. They also had one that was a little larger. And on this one, they used a poor quality gold, 1865 end of the Civil War, that might have had something to do with it. And you can see they used six pieces of gold on this cover. Uh, and the arrows are pointing to where they're all overlapping. And since it was a poor quality gold where it got stamped twice or with a double amount of gold, um, it looks much better. And on the title page, I'm, I'm, I have an arrow that points to sold only by subscription. So this was sold by canvassing agents and they probably showed a really nice, you know, gilt copy of this book to sell to people. But then this was the copy using this cheaper gold that you actually um, were delivered at the end. Now also to show you some of the things that they did to try to get um, as little gold on the book as they needed is they would stamp it in blind first, then lay the gold and then stamp it again. And there's been a lot of you know, discussion by people, you know, when did they put the gold on? Did they ever stamp it in blind first? And on the right hand side, you, you have this detail and you can see that they missed with some of the stamping. So clearly they had stamped it in blind first, laid the gold down and then stamped it again and just didn't get it in in the same place. Same thing is true of this book from 1850. There's also a, a nice um, kind of wrinkle in the cloth on the front cover. And then on the left-hand side, you can see that the gold stamping was done, uh, you know, a good quarter of an inch lower than the blind stamp that was put in. And because they were using gold so tightly, there's an arrow pointing at the bottom where the bottom of that ornament doesn't have any gold that it's stamped through. And it, it's because they were, they were able to get it so exact 
since they had the pattern of the design already, that once you stamp outside of, of where the design was before, you're no longer going to get any gold. And here's just another example of that uh, detail on the right showing how it's misstamped. Now, by 1855, some of the largest binderies in America were these huge factories, um, Harper being the number one example. And so this was a publisher who owned the printing and the binding. So they kind of had it all. So they can get better quality control, uh, unlike a publisher that's jobbing out to another bindery and, and probably isn't going to inspect every one of the hundreds and thousands of books that they get back. They could have better quality control, but even you know, with some of the largest binderies at the very end of the 19th century, you can still find a mistake because people are involved. So on the left, um, we can see the full front cover and on the right, we can see a detail. This wasn't stamped in blind first, it was stamped with an embossed pattern afterwards. And we know it was after the gold because um, the gold is all there. If it was done with the embossed pattern first and they missed, then you would see some gold that wasn't able to get down into some lower surfaces. They stamped it with an embossed pattern to make the flowers uh, kind of raised up out of it and, and give it just something a little extra. So you do see some mistakes later in the 19th century, but nothing like what you saw before, I would say, the Civil War. The Civil War seems to be a time period where they they really start to make fewer and fewer mistakes, much better quality control. And now this isn't necessarily a mistake, but it's just showing you how sometimes they were working. You can see on the, the right, the stamp that's done in gold on the front board, there's a little halo around it. And if we see uh, that kind of in detail, the, the arrows pointing to it, that's glare that they put down to get the gold to stick. Now, supposedly if they did the stamping within a couple days, there would be enough latent moisture in the case that it would activate the size of the cloth and that would act as a size to make the gold stick. So this appears to have been done later where the spine doesn't have this and the spine actually has a lower quality gold. So the, the spine has more impurities in the gold, you know, bronze that they could put in the gold, brass, um, other materials that would tarnish more over time and, and turn it this kind of um, a browner or redder gold as opposed to the more gold colored one of the front board stamp. So they were just done at different times. Why? I have no idea. Now casing in mistakes. Uh, it's easy enough to get a corner folded over when you're casing in, you know, especially when you think how they're working. So when they were casing in, they were you know, gluing up all of these text blocks, you know, with one board open, fitting them in with a case, and you can see the pile of cases there. And so by the time they get around to closing them, that um, piece of paper that they've applied adhesive to is curling, um, it's stretching, and so you wind up with problems like this on this book from 1837, where the arrow is pointing to the paper um, fold that you got because it's stretched. Here it's a machine made paper that was put on in an incorrect orientation. So it, it wants to stretch head to tail instead of stretching spine to foreedge, um, which you know a bookbinder can deal with, but because it's restrained at the spine, it can't really expand there. Then you wind up with that kind of bubbling. But you can also get these kind of mistakes where this machine made paper is in the correct orientation, but by the time they get to it or they close it, they're getting some kind of wrinkle in it. And it, it's bound to happen when you're doing hundreds of them in a day. And you know, I've had this happen to myself and I've only been working with one book. And you can also case in books upside down or backwards. So here again, the board is facing towards you so you can see the binding and the text at the same time. Um, here, the person put their name in, their ownership name in the front of the book uh, because they knew that was the front even though the binding was oriented towards the back. And this person didn't really look at their book at all and they put their book plate in, in the back for the text 
but it would have been the front for the binding. And what's interesting about this particular book, so this is the binding for um, the one we just saw with the book plate. This binding cost $5 in this scarlet um, binding that we're seeing here. It's, it's, uh, it's got a silk grain to it. It has a paper onlay on the front. It had gold edges. It was a superior fine vellum paper. $5 was a huge amount of money for the time period. So you would expect if you were paying that much money for your book, when most books only cost a dollar, maybe a dollar fifty, you should get the binding, you know, cased in in the correct way. It just seems strange to me that no one caught that. So um, now I want to move quickly to purposeful mistakes, and this isn't quite as large as the one we just saw. So here we have the title page on the right, we have the cover page on the left. One is dated 1840, the other's dated 1839. One's Portland, the other's court, uh, Concord, New Hampshire. So Portland, Maine, Concord, New Hampshire. O.L. Sanborn and company um, moved from Concord to Portland in between the time that they had this text block printed and did the binding. So of course, they updated the information on the cover. It seems like a mistake, but it's a purposeful one. Here's another one, a text block from 1855, which was a reprint of Uncle Reuben and his budget of stories. They had leftover wrappers for this kind of semi-limp binding um, left over from the 1851 edition. Um, they've added a partner in Smith, Clark and Austin has in that time period. And so you have a, an older date on the binding than you do on the text block. In this uh, example, you have uh, two books from a series. Um, they have the same you know, kind of edition on the front cover, the same spine, except at the bottom, one is Tickner and Company and the other is Fields, Osgood and Company. And that's because in the year between printing one out of this series and the other out of the series, Tickner and Fields um, became Fields, Osgood and Company uh, when they bought out Tickner. And so that changed. Now Fields Osgood and Company ends up morphing into Houghton Mifflin and Company, which is how you get a Boston Tickner and Fields 1867 text block with a Houghton Mifflin and Company binding on it. Because the text block either sewed or just in sheets sat around long enough for it to become Houghton Mifflin and Company, which was quite a few years later. So some books stayed in sheets for you know, decades before they were actually bound for the first time. And so you get this kind of a you know, mistake. Sometimes the um, binding that was used, um, those dies you know, are kept by most of the binders and then they're used again if they're reprinted, um, which you can see on the right. On the left is the D. Lathrop and Company reprint um, on a poor quality, thinner paper. And so the binding die for the spine ends up being too wide. And you can see that the east from steadfast is down into the, um, into the hinge area. Uh, and the whole you know, title kind of wraps into that area. And here's another example of a reused spine die with a later um, you know, kind of black East Lake Japanese inspired um, die. And that's because, again, this book was originally printed in 1865. We can see the copyright on the, the, um, the right hand, lower right hand side. Um, it was printed again, probably 20 years later, I'm going to say. It's undated. Um, and when they added the other ornaments, the spine die, the title die, which they would have kept from 1865, then didn't fit this other um, pattern that they were using. And so you get an overlap. So they stamped the gold first, then they stamped the black. And so that's why the black is covering the gold as opposed to the gold covering the black. Now, I think this is a corrected mistake in that the title was wrong. It's a cloth case, it's stamped with the boards. I don't see why they wouldn't have stamped the title. Um, so I, I'm thinking that they, put a leather label over an incorrect title. But the other possibility is that they had a case that just happened to fit 
this particular text block that was for another book. And so they had to cover up the title from the other book. And I think that's definitely probably what happened here. Um, I wouldn't think they would make uh, a mistake on a title where they're doing a full gilt spine like this because that's expensive to do. So I think they probably just had some cases left over from another um, job that ended up fitting this particular text block and all they had to do was put a new title on it. And so leather was the, you know, the best thing that they could do because it looks expensive, not like paper, which would have looked cheap. Now, both these books actually have mistakes. The one on the right here is stamped incredibly deeply. And I know it's hard to see in a slide like this, but I think if you look at the two um, titles, you can see that the one is, is pretty crisp and clean and the other one is all muddy because it is just stamped almost through that board. The other book seems to have a mistake where the backboard was stamped with the title for some reason. I have no idea what that reason was. And then what they did is they covered that backboard up. Um, they stripped off the cloth that was stamped in gold. They put this new piece of cloth on and I have arrows pointing at the top and bottom where you can see that cut edge to cover up the, um, the mistake, although there's still a, you know, a debossing into the board. So there's still that dent into the board. So they're trying to cover up a mistake there. And this is one of the more unusual ones. This is a, a very expensive printed cloth, which was popular. A lot of striped bindings were done around this time period, 1850, 1847. Um, this one, they cut all of the corners too short. So all four corners would have had this bare spot that they then went around and filled with little scraps of cloth to match, which tells me that someone's labor was not very expensive compared to the cost of the materials and they didn't want to lose those materials. Um, here's another book that I, I can only think was improperly cased in. Um, so they then recased it again with this very fancy paper, which distracts your eyes. But if you look at the um, both the backboard and the front board, the arrows are pointing to some white paper underneath that um, appears to be from an earlier use of this case. Um, and I, the only thing I can guess is that something happened. Maybe they did it upside down or something like that. They turned the book around, put new end sheets on, maybe trimmed it again and put it into this particular case. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the case. The case matches the book. Um, so it's the, it's the best explanation I can come up with for the use of those end papers. Now, altered um, bindings. Uh, so the, the two Robert Mary museums that you see on the left here, uh, they're from different dates, 1851 and 1854, but they use the same exact spine stamp. Now you couldn't use the same spine stamp for things with different years. So I think the spine stamp actually only had the first two numbers of the year, the one and the eight. And then they would go and they would put in the second two numbers for that particular issue. And you can get a sense here that they're putting in just the five and the one by itself. And since you're getting a lot of pressure with a very small surface area, it's going to dig deeper into that case. And you can see, especially with the beveled um, detail on the bottom, how it really is just driven in there. They may have done it by hand. I suppose they could have stamped it on a machine. It might've been just easier to do by hand. This is the Opal for 1848, which um, very luxurious leather binding um, with a date on it, both on the spine and the front board. Um, stated on the title page, didn't sell very well. So what do you do? You scrub all those dates off, change those dates, and then you can sell it in 1849 or 1850. So the arrows are pointing to where the dates got scrubbed from the title page. And the bottom is showing a later copy, well, not a later copy, but a copy that was sold later, where they've just taken some gold tooling and kind of blurred out the date on the spine. They did the same on the front and back board. Uh, and here is the decorative title paper where, title page where they even had to take the date off of that. 
Here's the token in Atlantic Souvenir on the left for 1842. And on the right, where the arrow is at the bottom, you can see they put in a dash three to try to make it seem like you could also sell it in 1843. Again, this was a, an expensive book that didn't sell well. And so on the left, we have the um, original 42. In the middle, we have one where they've just obscured the date of 42. They, it seemed like they picked out the original date and just put a device over it. On the right, they took a copy and they put that dash and the three on. And then they've also put a, a, a pictorial gold stamp to hide the embossed design that was there, uh, the embossed leather design, so that someone wouldn't notice it and say, hey, this is you know, the exact book I bought last year. So there obviously was enough um, of a profit to be made by having someone do the labor to alter these books. Here's another one, the fairy book, where it has a very large date, which seems to be you know, a, a little bit, uh, the, the cloth has some issues there. So I think they changed the date to 1842, even though the date on the title page, which you see is actually 1837. And this is probably the most famous one of these altered bindings. This is the rainbow for 1848. You can see the date in the center. This was a, a stereographic binding. Um, here we see it on a black leather copy, 1847, and a red leather copy, 1848, and A.L. Harrison, the binder, and his patent stereographic binding. The stereographic part refers to the colored um, leather that was done with a, um, a stamp that had um, pads or sponges on it that would be dipped in a pan of colored leather. And that's why it's done on this light colored leather so that you could see this um, color, it would stain it. And you can see on the left is the rainbow for 1847, which again sold horribly, less than half the copies sold in 47. Very expensive binding, very expensive book. So they just altered it. They put a, an onlay 48 for the binding, and then they altered every single part of the inside of the book. So the title page, they changed both things from 47 to 48. And then the pictorial title page, they just kind of um, sanded off the seven and then printed an eight there. And you can kind of see where it's disturbed. Um, a little bit. So again, the most famous one of the altered bindings. And just to end with um, what you would think would be the easiest thing for a binder to do, they were signing the book, last thing that they would do, they, they're advertising themselves, certainly they would get this in the proper orientation on the front board, um, as you see on the right in the detail, but it's actually the backboard upside down and they just made a mistake. The last place you would think a binder would wanna make a mistake and certainly the easiest one to avoid. Now I know I've taken up a lot of time. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for as long as we, we want, as long as Andrew, Linda and Karen want. Uh, I'm obviously not going anywhere in the pandemic. So uh, I'll happily take your questions now and I'm gonna end the screen share and turn my video on. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, there are quite a few questions. These um, I'm going to combine three for the first question because they're somewhat related. Uh, sure. The first is, how did you get interested in collecting mistakes? Um, then asking, where do you do most of your research? Are there a lot of observations here or are there papers you've read detailing these errors? And then the third related one just so you can answer them together. Excuse sure. me for a second. I gotta scroll down. Um, you've obviously done a lot of research um, to find all of these. Do you find that some library catalogs in fact mention these types of production errors or is this mostly just you looking for these types of errors? Well, let me start with that, the, the last part of that. It, it's pretty much me looking for these errors. Um, a few of them are kind of well known. The, the rainbow for 1847, which was altered to say 48. Um, there was a book dealer um, whose name is McDonald who wrote about that. So that is something that's pretty easy to, to find out about. 
most of the others, you know, librarians do the best that they can cataloging things, but they're trying to catalog for every user and they're trying to catalog for access. So they don't usually catalog mistakes. They don't usually catalog much about the bindings, which I'd, I'd really love to see them do more. Um, I got into collecting these mistakes because it, it just made me happy to see someone else making mistakes. I, I make mistakes all the time. And it makes me feel a little more comfortable to know that other people were making mistakes and um, hopefully weren't beating themselves up about their mistakes the way I, I beat myself up about it. And so most of the books that I find, um, I actually find back when we used to be able to go to bookstores and, and I just look, I love to go to bookstores, um, use bookstores. I, you know, I can spend hours and hours in them. And, um, you know, as I'm looking for other things at the binding, about the binding, um, you know, for my research into 19th century publishers bindings, I just come across these things. And so, you know, I try to buy them when I can and, and note them when I can. Most of the things we saw tonight are in my own collection. Um, I find it's just easier to study your own collection than it is to try to get access to books in all these different libraries, which is really handy um, today since, you know, it's not easy to get into most libraries at this point. Great. Um, somebody's wondering if these mistakes add to the value of the book, like the misprinted stamps. Um, you know, I, I would love to think that they do, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think there's much of a market for that. I, you know, I've never known anyone to write a lot about bookbinding mistakes. Um, you know, Nicholas Pickwood wrote a, a really fantastic article called Onward and Downward about how um, bookbinders, you know, between like 1500 and 1800, they tried to cheapen everything and, 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 and try to do things faster um, because of this, you know, pressure that they were getting on price. Um, but he wasn't focusing on mistakes. He was just saying, well, they, they stopped doing this or they did this instead, things like that. Which again, they, they weren't mistakes. They were just ways to make the process go faster. Uh, there's two more here. Um, in the first warehouse damage example, I would expect the binder to add the end sheets during the binding, the end sheets not really being part of the text block. Was it common for end sheets to be added as part of the book block, then sit around before binding? Well, definitely they were added as part of producing the, the text block. The only time that the, the, the case binding, uh, and that was a case binding, the only time the case came together with the text block in that kind of production was at the very end. So the, you know, the text block would, would get everything done to it and would be all ready for a case while the case would be produced you know, in this other part, sometimes in a separate room, in fact, and then they would be brought together as a last step. So it was very common to have the, the end sheets attached right after the sewing was done or as part of the sewing. A lot of the uh, end sheets, especially from the, the earlier part of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, those would be sewn on end sheets as opposed to tipped on end sheets. And then I think this is the last question. Um, if there were any questions put in the chat that I've overlooked, we'll um, address them in the continuing conversations on the website. Um, but this question is, many of the examples shown are cloth bindings that were textured or blind embossed. Was this created with stamping or hand tooled? And was the book cloth used typically a starch filled fabric? Um, so the book cloth was starch filled, um, and that was for a couple of different reasons. One, so that the adhesive that was applied to it wouldn't um, kind of soak through to the other side, because if you use an unstarched cloth, um, it's very porous, and whatever adhesive you applied to it would just go right through it. Um, almost all the things that we saw, you know, the blind stamping was stamping with a, with a, uh, a press. Um, stamping press as opposed to being tooled. Very rarely did you find um, blind tooling on cloth cases. And I'm not gonna say they never did it because of, you know, they, they would do everything. You know, as soon as you say they didn't do something, then someone's gonna be you know, emailing me with some pictures. Um, 
saying that I made a mistake. Um, so it, it was possible that they could do it, but it just wasn't really practical or warranted for that reason. If, if they were gonna tool a binding, they would just tool a, a cloth spine and then they would probably leave most everything else blank. Um, Todd, you provided a couple of links, um, which I'm going to put in the Rizuku site in continuing conversations. Do you want to mention anything about them before we wrap up? Um, sure. So one of the links is um, to the online Hathi Trust copy of the 1855, um, the Harper Establishment, um, also called the Story of the Storybooks. So Jacob Abbott wrote the storybooks for Harper's. Um, and then uh, Harper's ended up doing a, a storybook on how the storybooks were made, which came out in 1855, right after Harper's built a new plant, replacing one that had burned to the ground in December of 1853. And so this was an incredibly modern um, plant. Uh, and so it, it gives you kind of state of the art book binding in 1855 along with giving you other information about how illustration and printing was done. So it's, it's fantastic from book production as a whole, but in particular for how bindings were done, it's, it's really, um, it's geared towards young adults, but I think it's so accurate that, you know, even older adults like myself can get a lot out of it. And then the second link is to, um, a talk that Jennifer Rosner, the uh, chief conservator at the library company gave in November. And in that talk, she was talking about some of her own book finding research, some of which is on their website. And, you know, just what she's found out and, and how she got into it and some of those things. But one of the things that she did as part of the talk was to, to go over how they produced a binding, a cloth binding in the mid 19th century and she um, paired illustrations from books with her, um, her son working on a, a cloth bound book, making his own cloth bound books, just so that she could test some theories that she had about, um, you know, how easy was it to train someone to do this work? Um, and, you know, they were doing very specific aspects of the work. So if you were a woman folding sheets, that's what you did most of the time. Maybe you also did some gathering, but you probably didn't do sewing until you maybe acquired the skills to do the sewing. And the same would be true for a man who was covering or stamping a case. Um, so you were learning a, a specific task. And so she wanted to test how difficult it was to train someone to do a task and also to illustrate this um, talk that she gave. So I think it's it's a really good thing to, to watch if you don't know how a 19th century book was made and want to learn more about that. Great. Well, thanks so much, Todd. That was a really great talk. I really appreciate uh, you coming and sharing with us. It's been a lot of fun. I'm going to oh, it's my pleasure. Go ahead and put up our final remarks. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who came and joined us for this. Um, it's been um, both a little shocking and humbling to know that people have given up their time and either gotten up early or late in order to join us. And it's been a lot of fun having you join us for all these great presentations. I, I think we've enjoyed them uh, as much as all of you. Um, uh, and thanks for participating both in the conference website as well as here asking great questions. So thank you. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Once again, they really are the ones who helped uh, underwrite most of the cost of this conference and has really made it uh, a possibility for us to put all this together and to have these great presenters. Um, don't forget that you can find them in the virtual vendor fair. Um, if you want to go ahead and thank them or if you want to just see their website, see what they're doing. Again, a few of them are offering discounts that are going to last for a few more days. So there's still a chance to, to take that opportunity. You can find us at our website, of course, um, as well as on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, you can find out more about what we're doing by joining our email newsletter, and you can find that on our website.
We do have a few more, uh, uh, we have a few classes coming up soon, um, including Linda Marshall's Kakashibu and Washi on the 27th. My workshop on books for photographers and printmakers starting March 3rd. And Karen's on the storage book starting March 27th. Um, you can still see all the presentations uh, starting tomorrow. We'll have today's up, but all the presentations that we've had over these three days are now uh, video recordings that you can access through that webinar tab in the conference website. And if you still have questions or comments, there's still plenty of time. We're going to be leaving our conference website open for the next 30 days. And so you'll be able to uh, make some comments, uh, make some observations, um, continue this discussion. I think it's been great what's been going on and we just don't want it to end. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, it's been really great working with um, these great colleagues, Linda and Karen, and putting this together. We've had a lot of fun um, uh, kind of thinking this up and then, you know, throwing it out and seeing what happens. Uh, again, we've been pretty shocked at the response and pretty happy that we've been able to do this um, for our friends, colleagues, and, and uh, students. I just want to finally finish up by mentioning that you'll be receiving an evaluation after the conference and we'd really like to know your feedback on the format of the course area and the format of the events that we had both on the conference website as well as um, the lectures themselves. We really want to know um, kind of how much you enjoyed this and what we might do um, should we try to do this again. So thank you so much. Remember Keep chatting in that conference website because we'd love to continue this on. But thank you for joining us for our three days of live sessions. Thanks so much.